2 Timothy chapter 3. Our topic or our title for this evening's message is this, what is the Holy Bible? What is the Holy Bible? You probably know this, but many people use the term, don't they? The Bible. Uh, Many people who are not even Christians themselves. Sometimes I would listen to podcasts and there would be interviews with football managers and they would be talking about their tactics and the things they would do when they're facing different oppositions. And I have heard this from two different coaches. At one stage in their life, they wrote down everything they believed about the game. They write down what to do with different opposition, what to do in different situations. And guess what they would call that little book that they've carried around their entire life? My Bible. I've heard two managers say that over the last few years. It's interesting, isn't it, how they would call it their Bible. And I've heard that term, you hear this term used in common situations throughout life. It's almost like people know instinctively this is the rules which we follow in our lives. Now the, the, the word Bible itself just simply means book. It comes from the Greek word Biblia. So really the Holy Bible is the Holy Book. It is a special book. And why is it a special book? It's, it's very important today as we face an ever-changing society, as our schools begin to change more and more, as our government begins to change more and more, as society changes more and more around us, we need to know what this book is that we say that we follow. What is it Um, for our own growth in Christ, uh, to share with the next generation? If you have grandchildren, and you may have opportunities to share the truth with your grandchildren, with with the next generation down, with your own children themselves, even if they're grown up, nieces, nephews, people who are unbelievers, they might say, well, why do you believe this book? What is so special about it? What makes it different to any other book that has ever been written? Why should we listen to it at all? Does it ever make mistakes? And you know that there are Christians who will go to universities and they will be confounded with these things. You'll hear professors saying, well, I don't know, this, is, this book is full of contradictions. There's mistakes everywhere. And, th- and this is what young people will be bombarded with often when they go off to university. Are there contradictions in here? What do we mean by a contradiction? A contradiction would be to say, if, if you were to told to believe that black is white and white is black. Are there anything like that in the Bible? Or, or is it truth without error? Infallible, inerrant in everything it speaks about. Some people may say, no, this is not a science book. But dear friends, it is truth and everything it speaks of. All the facts in which it speaks of, it is true. It is truth without error. As we're going to be reading now th- for our reading this evening, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to notice one thing. Paul is mentoring Timothy, and Timothy's going to face challenging times. He's going to face all sorts of things. How is he going to face it? By continuing in the things he's been taught in the Holy Scriptures. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, let us hear God's holy and infallible word. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, tra- despisers of good traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, leading down, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, 
Now as Janes and Jambres resisted Moses, so did he also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and being assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And may the Lord bless the reading of his holy and infallible word. We'll be mainly focusing on for this topic, what is the Bible on the last three verses here, verses 15 to 17, which Paul the apostle is mentoring or instructing Timothy to really to take heed to these things and to continue in these things which you have learned, been assured of verse 14, knowing that from whom you have learned them. The Holy Scriptures. And verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. We deal with topics such as what we're dealing with this evening. What is the Holy Bible? Because sadly... In much of Western homes that would classify themselves as Christian, the Bible has become a mere ornament. It's, it's on the shelf. It's very dusty. And if it's been pulled off at all, maybe in a very long time. Perhaps it's never read. And if it is read, it's treated as a mere human book. And the church is probably guilty of that a lot because we treat the Bible just like any other book at times. And we've lost much of the respect and the awe of which this nation once had for the Bible. Queen Victoria's reporters have once have said this, that book, the Bible accounts for the supremacy of England. England has become great and happy by the knowledge of the true God through Jesus Christ. Now I have no intimate knowledge of how godly a woman Queen Victoria was. But we have no doubts, don't we? That men of the past had much admiration for the Bible. And much of this in common society has gone. While many in history have said nice things about the Bible, we may like the Bible in one way or another, but do we know what it actually is? Is it just a, a collection of interesting facts about God? Is it just partially true and partially false? And this is very important in how we interact with the Bible. Do we know what it is? Why we can and should have confidence? Not just in the big picture. We can say, okay, we know that Jesus is God and all this. But in every jot and every tittle and every single phrase that we're literally hanging on the very words of Almighty God, trusting them all. And this is why it is powerful and why we should hide it in our hearts, memorizing it and, and studying it. The first reason we're going to look at is its supreme author. Its supreme author. Now, how do we get the Bible? Now, not, you know, how is it bound together and, you know, maybe even different things and how it was translated into English or anything else like that. But how do we get the Bible? Our verse here tells us all scripture is given by inspiration of God, verse 16. 
And there's a lot of truth in that one phrase. In Greek, it's just three words. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And this speaks about all scripture. That first word is all or every, every single part, all parts of it, the entirety from Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation is given by inspiration of God. Every jot and every tittle, and every jot and every tittle, if you've never heard this phrase before, is the smallest part of the Greek alphabet. The smallest detail of it, all of it's written down. By God. So we are dealing here with all the writings. This is what scripture means. It's given by inspiration of God. That's what all scripture means. All scripture. Uh, graphe is the, the Greek word. And graphe you get the word you know, graphite. You get the word for writing. It's basically all the writings. Everything written has come from God. And we, we dealt with this this morning didn't we? The source of the light we were looking at in this morning's message is God. The source of the gospel is God. And the source of our Bible is God. Inspired by God. God is the supreme author of all scripture. That's why we can call it holy writing or sacred scripture. It basically means the same thing. Paul the apostle wrote this letter we're reading here. But God also wrote it. Now is that a contradiction? They say Paul wrote it. And God wrote it. How is that possible? Well we're really dealing with dear friends. Different categories. God is the infinite God. He is the first cause of all things. Paul is a mere creature. As an, as an instrument. As a means. But the answer is given here in our text. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Given by inspiration of God is one word in Greek. And really breaking it down, literally it's saying all scripture is God breathed. God breathed. There's, there's this picture here of God breathing out his word. That we have the word Theonustos. Theo, we get the word God. And Neustos, we get the word spirit or wind or even breath. And this is an action of the spirit of God. Paul wrote this letter we're reading, and we read this evening. But God wrote it. The spirit of God wrote it. The spirit of God breathed it out. Now, how can we understand this? Human authors, with their individual uh, personalities, with their individual talents and traits, all there. Yet, at the same time, the very word of God. And they were not forced. I think we might, sometimes when you think of this, we might think of, um, you know, you might think of that dictation. You know, like a body being taken over and starting to write. Not at all like this. It is men using their talents and everything else, but God directing them in such a way that it is truth without error. Moved along, you could say, by the Spirit of God. Moved in such a way that the, the Bible, every single part of this book, is without error. And just to say this, the perfection of the Word of God, the written Word of God, does not depend in any way upon fallible, weak men. Paul was a fallible man. Paul was a sinner. John the Apostle was a sinner. Moses was a fallible sinner. But why is the word of God infallible and inerrant without error? Because of the spirit of God. This is what it says in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 to 21. 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy or the word of God, never came by the will of man. But, and this is the important part, holy men of God speak as they were moved 
by the Holy Spirit. There's this moving along by the Spirit of God. Yes, the, the word of Paul, the word of that human author, but also the word of the living God. We're just going to turn to one part of the scriptures to make, to, let's see this in another part. It's Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, verse 36. Mark chapter 12, in verse 36. And then in this, Jesus is quoting from the Psalms. He quotes from Psalm 110, verse 1, in fact. And he says this about Psalm 110, verse 1. He says this, For David himself said, By the Holy Spirit, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand, Till I make your enemies your footstool. So David wrote this. David wrote Psalm 110. But the Spirit of God also wrote Psalm 110. Uh, guiding along in such a way that we can say the Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of Revelation 22 is the very Word of God. Powerful. The Word of God. I don't know if any of you have ever seen those... Um, uh, red letter Bibles. I'm not necessarily against them. I don't think they're the worst thing in the world. But there's one potential danger with red letter editions of the Bible. You know, they're apparently the words of Jesus in red and, and every other thing is, is in black. The danger is we think they're the only words of Christ in the Bible. Um, Christ is God. He is the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. But listen to what it says here, and this is about the Psalms in Colossians 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The Psalter is called by Paul when he writes to the Colossians, the word of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. How would you let that happen? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are just titles that are used for the 150s, what we call psalms. But if you look through all the titles, some of them are called psalms, some of them are called hymn, hymnos in, 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 uh, in Greek, and then some of them are called spiritual songs, or songs of degrees and different titles like that. But it's the very word of Christ. All these titles used in the Psalter, all of the, the Bible really speaks of Christ. All of the Bible is the word of God. It says this in question three of the Westminster Larger Catechism. The Westminster Larger Catechism, question three. What is the word of God? The Holy Scriptures, it says, of the Old and New Testaments are the word of God. The only rule of faith and obedience. The only rule of faith and obedience. This is the supreme guide to test us all. All authorities, there are, there are other authorities on this world, but they all are under the word of the living God because of who <coughs> wrote it and who gave it to us. It's the only rule of faith and practice, the supreme rule of faith and practice. It is why, dear friends, we sing psalms in worship. There's songs that have been written that are very nice, and, and instruments would be nice, wouldn't they? But we, as a denomination, go according to the regulative principle of worship, and we believe that only those things that are commanded are allowed in worship. The Word of God governs how we are to do things within the Christian church. The Word of God has a supreme author. Its supreme author is God. Now the thing about it is, God has written this. Do we read it? Knowing this, knowing that this is a, uh, you could even think of a love letter from God. Do we read it? Do we cherish it? Do we go over the words? Do we hide it in our hearts in times of trouble? This brings us on to our next point, number two. It's sanctification. It's sanctification. It's special of who wrote it 
But what are we to use it for? Verse 16 tells us what we are to use it for. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So we know that it's special from where it comes from. We know that it is holy because it has been guided along with the Spirit of God. But what's it to be used for? Again, it is not just merely to be an ornament there, to sit on the shelf. It tells us what we are to believe and we are to follow it, apply it to our hearts, uh, to be changed and conformed. It's profitable for us. You know, you know, we know the word profit, don't we? Profit. It's good for us. You know, you go to work for a profit. You get extra money and you can buy things and maybe you go on holiday one day, different things like this. But this is profitable in the most important way that anything can be profitable. This is eternal profitability. Far greater than any other profitability to make us more like God. Holy. Its goal really is sanctification. And that word sanctification means to be changed, made more like God. God. Question 5 of the Westminster Larger Catechism talks about this. And the Westminster Larger Catechism is one of our, what we call, subordinate standards. Our standard is the Word of God, but what does the Word of God teach? And we summarize this in the Confession of Faith and also in the Catechisms. But question 5 says this, what do the Scriptures principally teach? Answer, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of men. What we're to believe about him, we get from the word of God. He tells us. Because otherwise we're going to use our own imaginations, aren't we? And we're going to get things wrong. Uh, and what we're all, so what's our duty before God? Now, what happens when our minds are changed by God? We're made more like him, to think like him, to love what he loves, and also, dear friends, to hate what he hates. And it'll also change our behavior. People around you will see the difference. They will. Even believers in other churches, you might meet up with them and go, hmm, something's different with you. You may not be born again the other day or something like that, but you, people will notice the difference. Friends, we never get to a point where we outgrow the need for the Bible and where we can not grow anymore. All of us can grow. It says this in John 17, 17. What did Jesus pray before his Father? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And the word of God is there to make us holy because it is profitable for doctrine. This is teaching. To fill our minds, not just fill our minds with information, but to make us more holy, to think as God thinks, to think after his ways. And how are we to get there? By learning of God. To be taught instruction, we need to do this. And, and this, this idea can be shunned by many today. It sounds like too much work. Christianity in the West today has become so dumbed down. It really has. It has become the lowest common denominator across the Western world. It's not just Northern Ireland, Scotland. And we're afraid of driving away the unbeliever. Dear friends, the unbeliever needs a new heart. What's going to bring people into the churches is the Spirit of Almighty God. It's not going to be our clever ideas. It's going to be the Word of the living. It's going to be things that exalt him. It's going to be about... Now, the worshipper. When the, believe, when the unbeliever comes to the worship service, there will be a sense in his heart, here's something I don't have. Here's something I lack. Uh, here's something that I wish I had, but they know they don't love God. They're wrestling with things. Yes, we should be welcoming. Yes, uh, we should not wish to have anything that would stop them from coming to church. But at the same time, what holds people back from coming to church 
is people's animosity to the truth. This word is powerful. The Spirit of God is powerful. That's the only thing that's going to change people. It's not us. We're just delivering the message. Do you wish to be taught? The Bible says here, or the, the scriptures say, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. Regardless whether you're old or young, you may be near the beginning of your walk, you may be near the end of your walk, you may feel. But we never reach a point where we can't learn more. It's not possible. And dear friends, this is how the church will grow here in Rathrell. It's going to grow in here, in here, before we're ever going to make an impact out there. It's true. The Word of God has to make such an impact in our hearts and our lives that it will flow out of there. I'm absolutely convinced of that. I remember a godly man who taught me in college, and I remember he didn't tell me this directly. One of the men in his church said, we're gonna focus on you men right in front of us. There were a small group of men, and he taught them for many years. Small group at the beginning, and they grew, and they grew, and God blessed it over many years. There's no magic formula, it's teaching. It's us as a group being closer to God, and by that, by also being closer together, it begins there, and then outside there, we can point them towards the truth that is hiding in our hearts, that we love those people out there, that we, we have sat at the feet of Christ so much that they just see we love him so much. It just flows out of us. We're not trying to work ourselves up to be able to have the confidence almost just to be able to share the gospel. It's just so, you know, you prick the skin and it just bleeds Bible. That's what we need to strive for, to be different people by the word of God. That is the sanctification. And look, it's for doctrine, for reproof, we need to be corrected at times. We need correction, all of us, me included, by the way. All of us need correction. None of us have said, oh, I'm, I'm finished, I can put up my feet and uh, wait until I you know, go to heaven. None of us have gotten to that point. All of us need correction, all, all of us need, and the great thing is, friend, when the Lord corrects us, there's greater joy. Ahead, if we learn from it, if we learn from it, for instruction in righteousness. These things may be difficult at the time, but they bring us closer to him. Number three now. So we've looked at its supreme author, its sanctification. Number three now, its sufficiency. Its sufficiency, and the word sufficient means enough, or lacking in nothing. We must not think that the Bible is holding back anything from us. Or that there's something more we need on top of it. And this can be really, really tempting today. It says in verse 17 this, that the man of God may be complete. That the man of God may be complete. You know, there's, there's more and more of a temptation to go to, well, are there dreams? Are there extra revelations? I remember I was saved a few months and a guy would ring me up. For a few weeks in a row at about 8 o'clock in the morning and tell me all about the dreams he had. And I was a young believer, I had no idea what to think of it. I said, well, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. And it drove me into studying this topic. Well, I think he was a sincere believer, but seemed incredibly tormented with different things. We know this view is very common in the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements. The word of God is complete. It has everything we need. It has everything we need. Now the word here, man of God, it can specifically be referring to somebody who's in the ministry. Paul is writing to Timothy. He's in the ministry. And the word, the word man of God can specifically be referring to the man in the ministry. But it, it, we can't just apply it just there. Um, if it is complete and enough for the man in the ministry, well, it's also complete and thoroughly equipped for every single person. So regardless of how we understand that term, nothing is lacking. Now we may 
think, well, didn't God speak at various times in the past? And that's true. In the Old Testament, God spoke in dreams and special revelations. Now, by the way, this was never the norm. It was never the norm. It was never the norm. It was very unusual even in the time of Moses. That's why they were special in the first place. It says this in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. And verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Now people ask me sometimes, you know, are, are we in the last days? And I say, yes. And I say, we've been in the last days for the last 2,000 years. The scriptures has a definition of what the last times mean. We may have a different definition at times, but it depends what you mean by last days. The last days have been going on for the last 2,000 years. Paul said in these last days, and the term's also used by Peter and other people as well, when they're talking about that term, they're talking about from the time of Christ all the way to the time of his return. God has spoken by his son in these last days. He is the word. He is the word of God. And the canon is closed. Um, near the end of the book of Revelation, it says this, very fitting. It says, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God shall take away his power from the book of life. From the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Don't add to it. It's almost like a bit of a full stop at the end of the scriptures. Now we're always curious. We always want to know more. I'll put it like this, dear friends. If we did know more, it wouldn't help us. You know, we all want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. We all like to know how this thing's going to pan out and all this. If we did know about it, it wouldn't help us. God's ways are better. He is wise in the things he brings in that we can learn about. People, very much so. There's also another thing, um, if you listen to a lot of um, Christian media, you'll also come across this as well. You know, the idea of, well, dreams and people claiming to have seen even Jesus come back. There's a lot of this. We must have confidence in the sure, the more sure word of God. I'm just going to, before we get on to the next point, there's one comment that Martin Luther made that I think will be very helpful on this topic. Martin Luther, by the way, dealt with issues that we're dealing with today with the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement. They were called the Zwickler prophets of the day. They came up to Melanchthon and Luther and they're going, guys, you're missing out. We're getting dreams and revelations and you guys, you're, you're, well, I, you're, you're quenching the spirit. And it's very, very similar to that. Luther said this, and he's, he's writing to Melanchthon when he says this, a very famous reformer of the day. First of all, since they bear witness to themselves, one need not immediately accept them, according to John's counsel. The spirits are to be tested. Luther was saying, look, if he's going to be according to the Old Testament prophets or anything else, where are the signs of miracles and wonders? He also says this, Thus far I hear of nothing said or done by them that Satan could not also do or imitate. This is Martin Luther right to Melanchthon. You find out whether they can prove whether they are called by God. For God has never sent anyone, not even the Son himself, unless they were called through men and attested by signs. So if anybody comes to you with a dream or revelation or anything else like that, they better come with signs and wonders. Not their account of their memory of signs and wonders, but signs and wonders. And this is certainly not happening today. Our fourth point, our final point here this evening, it's saving wisdom. It's saving wisdom. Paul is writing to Timothy about the threats he will face at the beginning of chapter 3. He talks about Timothy is to continue in these things. Verse 14, it says this, but you must continue in the things which you have learned. Oh, where have they learned them from? The Holy Scriptures. The, and he has known them from childhood. Very, very young. And this supreme wisdom is supreme to all the enemies that they will face. This wisdom is basically this, looking unto God. 
the author and the finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. And spiritually, dear friends, there's only two types of people in the world. There are those, as it says here, who are wise for salvation, verse 15, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. What's the opposite of wise? Foolish. There's only two groups of people in the world. You could be, you know, the Richard Dawkins in the world, the most clever, brilliant, and there are some very clever people who've written brilliant books and they are, in their own field, they are geniuses. But spiritually, they're foolish unless they look to Jesus Christ. The scriptures have the supreme saving wisdom able to make you wise unto salvation as they did to Timothy from a young age. A wise person will look to God and they'll, they'll basically say this, my way is bad. Very, very simply. My way is bad. My way will lead to destruction and death. God's way leads to eternal life and blessing. The, the wisdom which comes from embracing God's word will save you. And also we say God's word, specifically today, God has spoken to us in these last days. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all, all the churches. But only for those who have faith in Christ. We must not read the Bible in a mere intellectual way. What I mean by that is, you often hear of people who like to read Ruth. Ruth is pretty popular to study, I think, in universities. And they'll read the King James Version usually because they love the prose and they love how it sounds and it's, they think it's brilliant literature. I, I was listening to something on the radio about this one time. The people were not Christians. Mere head knowledge of the facts will not save you. Do you love God? Have you looked to Jesus Christ? And if you, if you do love God, and it will alter your life. It will change how you live. Uh, it's not just going to be your hobby. It will make you wise. Wiser than people who are very, very gifted in other areas you may not know much about. But you will have the wisdom where it matters. And that is looking unto the light of life. Wisdom needs help. The helplessness of creatures needs help. We're, we're just mere dust. Timothy has to realize when he's reading this, Paul's writing to him, that Timothy, you're going to face things that in your own strength are insurmountable. This is something I have to learn as well in the beginning of my own ministry. I'm, you know, in my own strength, I'm going to fail. It's not even a question. It's just a, it's just a guaranteed uh, fact. But Timothy, you've got, to, you've got to continue in the things which you have learned and stay within the Holy Scriptures. This is what has to guide you. Looking to Him. Otherwise, the Word of God is not seen as the Word of God to you. Question 4 of the Westminster Large Catechism says this. How does it appear that the Scriptures are the Word of God? And sir, the scriptures manifest themselves to be the word of God by their majesty and purity, by the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole which is to give all glory to God, by their light and power to convince and convert sinners, to comfort and build up believers into salvation, but the spirit of God bearing witness by and with the scriptures in the heart of man, is alone able to fully to persuade it that they are the very word of God. Do you see what it's saying? We see when we read the scriptures, this is not an ordinary book. The spirit of God works in our hearts to confirm that this is the very word of God. The sheep hear my voice. We are a sheep, are we not? Do we not hear his voice? Do we not recognize the voice of the shepherd? The enemy may come along and say, oh, yea, hath God said, and we know that he's a liar because we know the voice of the shepherd. We know his word 
It's light, it's power, it convinces, it, it, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, this is Paul speaking in a certain type of language. There's no foolishness or weakness at all in God. We looked at that this morning. God is simple. He is pure power. He is pure glory. He is pure light. He is pure seeing. He is pure hearing. But in anything that may seem foolish to mere men, it is far more powerful than anything they can do. God's wisdom is revealed and shown in his word. And it's only by faith that we can embrace it. Only by faith. If we don't have faith, we won't see these things. We won't. We will see these things by faith and by faith alone. Just to think of it in this way. Do you ever have this one friend? Do you know you're in trouble? And you just love to ring him up whenever you're in trouble. And you like to listen to your advice. They just calm you down. You're all worried about something. And you ring that friend up. Talking to him for 15, 20 minutes. And you just love their advice. You're almost hanging on every word. Because you respect them so much. You enjoy what they say. But what of the word of God? Do you love this counsel? Do you think that this is the wisest counsel? It's good to have good friends. It's good to have good Christian friends especially. Uh, some people are very wise in certain areas. But there's no wisdom that is like the scriptures. They're able to make you wise for salvation. What is the Bible? Somebody might ask you, I work tomorrow. What is the Bible? It is the mouth of God. Canterbury was Augustine said this. It is the two lips, the Old and New Testament. God speaks. He's speaking to us today. People say, is God speaking to us today? Yes, he is. If you want to hear the Bible, if you want to hear the word of God audibly with your ears, read it out loud. The mouth of God, he has spoken. He has spoken. Do we love him? As believers, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, there will be a love for the word of God, a natural love for the word of God. Something that will comfort us. Something that will bring light to our walk. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we need a revival today, don't we? Across Rathman, across, across Northern Ireland, across the, the whole Irish island, across... We need a revival of a love. Not just for coming to church. But a love for God's word. And when that happens, we'll see how far far short we fall. When revival comes, it doesn't just bring people in here. It changes the church. If you go through all the scriptures and you see Nehemiah and other parts of the scriptures, the church has changed first. And then it flows out. Dear friends, we want to see a love for the word out there. We need to grow in our love in here. A love for the voice of God. That when we pray and cry out to God, that he would hear our cries and have mercy upon this place. And that God would be honored and glorified in all these things. Amen.